OK, so welcome to this last session of the second day of the Seeding Fest. I'm Pablo, a uh, researcher at Eurecat and adjunct professor at Pompeo Fabra, and most importantly, a member of the, the sitting team. And today we have this panel uh, that is, we call it uh, Participation by Design. Uh, and the motivation for doing this panel is like, well, much has been said about the internet uh, becoming a, a toxic space, disinformation, hate speech, uh, trolling, calling harassment, like, well, many keynotes and talks already of Decident Fest have been covering like examples of these problems happening in the internet. And we have seen like many platforms have invested a lot of resources to build sophisticated uh, technological approaches to detect and prevent these problems. But we observe that these problems persist. Um, probably these problems persist because they are not only technological challenges, but rather social, cultural, and political. So for this reason, we are very thankful for having today Amy Zhang and Nathan Matthias, uh, outstanding, uh, outstanding scientists that have conducted seminal research works on how uh, design and interventions in online platforms can contribute to avoid these problems and at the same time to promote safe participation, deliberation, and community health. So the structure of the session today, we will have uh, two short talks by the panelists to introduce their work, and then there will be a debate around uh, 20, 30 minutes with questions that has been posted by members of uh, this, the meta SDN community in the page. Still, if you post some comments, we will read them, and also some challenges that we pre-identified uh, relevant for the roadmap of the SDN. So I will introduce our first, pa our first panelist, Amy Zhang, who is an assistant professor at the School of Computer Science Eng and Engineering in the University of Washington. Previously, she was a postdoc in the Stanford University of Computer Science uh, Department. Uh, he, uh, she made her PhD in the MIT uh, uh, Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Laboratory, and she was a fellow at the Ber Berman Klein Center at Harvard University and she will present part of her research in social computing and human-computer interaction that has received Best Paper Awards and mentions in conference like CSCW or CHI and has been covered in media like BBC, ABC, The Birds, New Scientist, and Pointer. And what I like most from Amy is like she's not only a researcher that observes human behavior and social dynamics online, but also a creator of systems to innovate and improve online discussions. So thank you very much, Amy, for being here. And the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Pablo, for the introduction. OK, I'm going to share my screen. We tried this earlier. Hopefully, it works. OK, can everyone see this? Um, OK, so I'm going to be talking to you today about um, some software tools in our lab to enable participation in online governance. And as Pablo mentioned, I'm a new assistant professor at University of Washington in the Allen School of Computer Science and Engineering. Um, and a little bit about our group. I recently started a new lab at UW called uh, the Social Futures Lab. And we're dedicated to reimagining social and collaborative systems to empower people and improve society. And our focus in order to achieve that goal is really to um, focus on designing and building and deploying new software tools to be able to prototype that future. Um, and in this talk, I'm going to give a really quick tour of some of the projects I've worked on in the past to give you kind of a flavor of how we're trying to instantiate that vision. Um, so one of the areas I'm really interested in related to the topic of this panel is enabling more participatory forms of governance in places where that's just not really possible or it's really hard to do today. Um, and actually, when you look around today and you think about all these different software tools that you do use for socializing, for collaborating with each other, um, it's actually kind of striking how similar and also how rudimentary the, their governance um, that they support is. Um, almost all of these platforms involve some kind of model that um, has admins and mods or moderators and regular users, where if you're an admin or a mod, you have some ability to govern others. Uh, but if you're a regular user, you have no say in the governance structure. So it's this very kind of like top down autocratic system of governance. Um, but you know, what if you wanted to have a more participatory style of governance in your online community? What if you wanted to have elections or deliberative democracy? 
Um, right now, you basically have to do it manually because the, none of the software tools support it. Um, uh, and one of the projects that we did were, was um, we thought, you know, what if communities could actually build for themselves the kind of governance that actually best suits their community's needs and values? Um, so that's this project, Policy Kit. Um, so to enable communities to come up with the governance that suits them, we built this tool. The way it works is first you connect Policy Kit to your community that's already existing on Slack or Discord or Reddit. Uh, and then you can use our tool to instantiate um, the form of governance that your community wants. So for instance, you could set up you know, a rotating election system where you have an election to elect new moderators every two years. Um, and then after you set that up in our tool, our tool then takes care of actually implementing and carrying out that governance for you on your platform of choice. Um, and you can also, as an experiment, uh, as a community, experiment and evolve your governance over time as you respond to changes in the community. Um, and in the future, we're planning on um, additional extensions, like being able to share and fork and merge your governance with other communities and be able to learn from each other. Um, so this is kind of a new project in our group, and uh, I think a really exciting direction um, for introducing these more flexible and participatory forms of governance into these online spaces where we haven't really seen this um, so far today. Um, so that's one project to enable more participatory governance in online communities, um, places like your Slack group or your Facebook group. Uh, we're also interested in governance at the entire platform level, where you see the same issue of kind of top-down governance, uh, where most people don't have any say in how the platform as a whole moderates content. Um, so one of our projects, the Digital Juries Project, looks at what it would mean to have um, like things like a citizen jury system to be able to do content moderation on platforms like Facebook. Um, so here we were particularly interested in how different governance procedures actually affected people's perceptions of legitimacy. Um, so we did a number of experiments. We found that people perceive things like user juries um, as more democratically legitimate than the current status quo of kind of top-down paid and algorithmic content moderation. Uh, and another finding from that study was that, you know, not all participation is equal. We found that um, people had a preference for deliberative juries over voting juries. Um, and there are also different opinions on whether juries should have final say or should only make recommendations to the platform. So this participant in our study said, if it's just a recommendation, it would feel like a waste of time. I don't think the platforms will care about recommendations. It's just something they will ignore when they want to and cite as evidence of caring about user's opinion when it's convenient. So I think this goes to the point um, made memor memorably by Sherry Arnstein in A Ladder of Citizen Participation from 1969, which I'm sure um, many of you are familiar with, that just en enabling participation is not enough. Uh, but we do have to think about the quality of that participation and whether or not we're really handing over real power to people who don't have the power to make change currently. Um, so this question of not just like enabling participation in spaces that haven't had participation in the past, but also looking at how to design participation um, came up in a project where I collaborated with a team out of UMass Amherst, um, led by a grad student, Mahmoud Jazim and uh, Professor Narjis Meyer. And here we looked, um, did a deep dive into local city town halls and found that there is a real problem with inclusivity in some of these spaces where even people who do attend these meetings in person, and at the time we did the study, it was still happening in person, um, they're still often nervous about speaking up or don't have a chance to speak up in the meeting. Uh, meanwhile, the organizers of the town hall don't um, have the ability to incorporate everyone's feedback into their post-town hall reports because it's, you know, it's hard to take notes and run the meeting at the same time and it's easy to forget things. So um, another project here was um, uh, our team worked on ways to capture these kind of multiple avenues of feedback using tools like iClickers, using audio to text transcription tools, um, and then building a platform where we incorporated all those signals into this report authoring tool um, to allow organizers to more easily write these kinds of like more comprehensive reports. Um, we've also thought about different forms of participation in the context of online discussion and, and these online communities where um, you're in a forum or you're in a group chat and you can you know, add comments all day long, but there aren't 
that many good mechanisms for actually listening or understanding other people's comments. Um, and so in both of these systems, um, Wickham on the left-hand side, which is for discussion forums, um, so more asynchronous, and Tilda on the right, which is for these kind of group chat applications like Slack, we think about um, all these other things that community members could be doing to help with the actual curation of the discourse. Um, like when these forum threads get super deep and long with thousands of comments, uh, or people are chatting and chatting and new people find it really hard to catch up. Um, you know, what if community members could actually be able to do things like help each other with um, summarizing some conversations or grouping and tagging them um, so they're more manageable for everyone in the community to read. Um, and again, this gives people more avenues for different forms of participation besides just commenting. So that was just kind of like a quick overview of some of the work in our lab. Uh, I just want to say there's there's lots, I believe, that as developers and designers, we can do to really think how to improve participation um, and how participation can work in social and community software. Almost all the tools I mentioned to you are available to use online. Um, they're open source. Um, uh, feel free to reach out to me over email or Twitter. You can read our research papers, learn about some of the other projects I didn't get a chance to mention. Um, and I'm just gonna leave you with a quick note from uh, a quick quote from um, anthropologist Chris Kelty, who's also written a great book on participation that I'll recommend, and which I think is a great reminder for us doing work in this space. Um, so, you know, the enthusiasm for participation has increasingly been matched by quicker, faster, more flexible implementations of participation. We sometimes speak of participation as a purpose, an end that we assimilate to democratization or liberation, but it's just as often implemented as a means to achieve goals that turn out to be inconsistent with that purpose. Too much surveillance, too much unpaid labor, too much devolution of responsibility, too much democracy in all the wrong places. And I think this quote is really great motivation for us to, to continue to think about how we can best design participation. Um, okay, and with that, I will send it back to you, Pablo. Okay, so thank you very much, Amy. Uh, I totally agree with this idea of enabling participation is not enough. Like we need to give voices uh, to the ones who usually do not, do not participate. So I remember the people who are in the streaming or who are following in different channels that they can add questions and I will give preferences to those questions rather than one from the moderation to try to have a much more diverse view in the debate. But before the debate, obviously, uh, Thank you, Amy, and we have uh, Dr. Nathan Matias, who is a Guatemalan American assistant professor in the Cornell University, um, and then, uh, as a founder of the Citizens and Technology, and Technology Lab, formerly known as Civil Servant, a public interest research group that organizes citizen behavioral <laughs> science and behavioral consumer protection research for digital life. And, uh, this lab has worked with communities with millions of participants in Reddit, Wikipedia, Twitter, to test ideas for preventing harassment, broadening gender diversity on social media, responding to human algorithmic misinformation, managing political conflict, uh, conflict, and auditing social media. Of imagining a world where digital power is guided by evidence, wow. power is a good thing, um, but it needs to be guided by evidence and accountable to the public. And so Cat Lab organizes citizen science or community science to test the social impacts of digital technologies and discover effective ideas for change. So let's talk about what that might mean for Decidum. Um, uh, and we can take uh, as an example, a question of like, what can the Decidum ecosystem do to prevent harassment? And how might behavioral research help? Now, the first thing to acknowledge is that Behavioral science and experimentation aren't the only important form of research here, as you've heard from Amy, who does amazing design work. And there are a range of questions that you could ask, right? You to, to ask this question about preventing harassment, you might need to know who is signing up for Decidum. And you do interviews, ethnography, you might do surveys, you might do data analysis. You might need to understand what kinds of harassment are happening on the platform. And similar methods could help you explore that question. Uh, you might wanna know what factors predict or are associated with harassment, who's engaging it. And those are the kinds of questions that similarly descriptive research can help you answer. You might ask what kinds of support people actually need 
to participate fully uh, without fear of risks and harm. And those are things that holding community discussions, uh, engaging in the work of design can be incredibly powerful, much like many of the examples that Amy shared. And then once you've done those things, you're faced with the question, what are the actual effects of the interventions that you design? Right? You have an understanding of the issue. You imagine that introducing new technologies or new social programs or new support could make a difference, but you want to know if it's actually working and if it's meeting your goals. That's where experiments can be incredibly valuable because experiments ask what if questions and they test ideas for change. Uh, I won't go in depth about this, but this is maybe helpful for those of you who are less familiar with experimentation, new to it. Uh, all experiments have five basic components. This is actually a card that we use in our community co-design sessions when we're working with Wikipedians or Reddit communities. Um, an experiment has an overall goal, for example, like preventing harassment or welcoming newcomers. You have a theory of change, some explanation for why that problem is happening or how that goal could be achieved. Uh, you have recipients, like who is going to receive this intervention? Like, are you trying to support people who don't have power to have more power? Are you trying to shift and influence people who already have power and part of the problem? Um, there are recipients of, of whatever idea you have. You have ways of measuring the outcomes and you have some intervention, the thing that you want to do in the world that you hope will create change. Here's an example of an experiment that I did a few years ago with uh, a group calling themselves the New Reddit Journal of Science. This is a 14 million subscriber community at the time. Now they have over 20 million subscribers uh, that faces a lot of online harassment, especially when they talk about politically sensitive topics or questions that uh, are fraught in, in global society, questions about racism, et cetera. Uh, and they wanted to know, can posting community rules prevent harassment by influencing people's awareness of social norms? And in social psychology, we often think about the fact that our behavior is guided by our understanding, our perceptions about what's common or acceptable to others, whether from individuals or institutions or groups. And so we designed an experiment where we uh, posted information about what was acceptable in the community to some discussions, and not to others, and then we measured the outcomes. And the end of an experiment, actually, these slides are a bit, I'll, I'll come back to that slide because that should, should be my final slide. Um, so we were curious about this question because there was a debate. Do policies against harassment stifle or broaden speech rights? Some people said, well, if we have clear policies against harassment, it will reduce participation. And other people said, well, no, it'll actually increase participation because people will feel safe. And so we collectively designed this uh, message that we posted to the top of discussions. It named the behavior that was unacceptable. It named the consequences. It established the legitimacy of this norm by saying how many people uh, were against harassment. This is these components you can think of as related to the theory of change. We had this idea about social norms, we translated it into an intervention, and then we were able to test it by measuring the rate of harassment in a community. And that's how an experiment works. You have one group that receives an intervention, one group that receives something else, and then you compare the outcomes between the groups. In this particular study, we found that posting the rules increased the chance of rule compliance. So it reduced harassment um, and it also increased participation. So we thought there was maybe this trade-off between preventing harassment and maybe deterring participation, but that wasn't true. We were able to both increase participation and reduce harassment at the same time. And the experiment helped us uh, evaluate and determine that this intervention was actually working. So that's an example of an experiment. You know, by creating knowledge about how to influence behavior, uh, experimentation is this form of power, but people worry that it might be abused in very undemocratic ways. And many people mistrust experimentation. And there are arguments that um, we should leave experimentation out of the democratic process, most notably 
Peter John has an article, Nudge, Nudge, Think, Think, that engages with this question. And this is actually a question that people have been asking for many decades now. In the 1940s, the social psychologist Kurt Lewin was approached by the Harwood Clothing Factory, uh, which was struggling to understand its management problems. They carefully defined quantified worker tasks, they tracked employee performance, and tried to control their lives inside and outside of work. Uh, and then they were confused about why people were performing badly, getting upset, and leaving. And, and Lewin, who himself had barely escaped Nazi Germany, called this kind of data-driven management autocratic and anti-democratic. Writing about the experience later, he drew a line between what he called autocratic and democratic uh, organizations and the research associated with them. He argued that by using experiments to study the social forces shaping human behavior, a democratic commonwealth could apply scientific investigation to its own processes of group living. And over the next 10 years, he and his students really reinvented factory research, developing an approach called action research that was partly driven by workers themselves. They involved workers in discussions and votes about the research itself, uh, help uh, work together on setting goals, designing interventions, and even analyzing data together. And this work formed the foundations of several academic fields including social psychology and organizational behavior in, in the US. And that's what we do at CatLab, where we co-design research with communities. The details of this chart don't have much time to go in today, but the key thing is that in our process, communities co-design the details from the various, very earliest stage of proposing the questions all the way through the analysis and interpretation of results. And we've seen that communities also learn from each other taking code and research designs from each other and doing what's called a replication to find out if an idea works in more than one context. So with that set of ideas in mind, here are some ideas for just discussion prompts for the decidum ecosystem. One is uh, to encourage the decidum community to think about investing in reusable software architectures and infrastructures that bring down the cost and effort of new experiments. That's one of the core innovations that we've developed at CatLab. Uh, by investing in infrastructure, we make it cheaper and easier for communities to do this kind of research. Also to collaborate on metrics and on the whole research design with communities. Time and time again, we found that one community's understanding of harassment or meaningful participation might be different from another communities, or that we as researchers think we understand the platform, but actually people are using it in a different way than we expected. Um, and then uh, two final things, designing ethics and accountability in the research project is a really valuable way to improve the quality of the work, the ethics of the work, and the credibility of the work. And then finally, this idea of building collaborations across communities to achieve scale. We just finished a study with uh, four different language Wikipedias, uh, none of them individually was large enough to do a really large scale experiment. But because they were all working together on this study, we were actually able to collaborate to create the kind of knowledge they needed to test their ideas together. So with those promptings, I'm really excited to take the conversation uh, forward into our discussion. Is it can, can, can I talk? Okay, so thank you very much, Nathan. Uh, I think it's impressive what you you presented. Uh, like this uh, suggestions idea about the CDM, I was thinking like uh, from the beginning of the CDM, it was a platform that it was conceived to replicate for participation. So the modular structure of the CDM was thought to be very easy to be replicated in different scenarios. And that's why it has been used now in many places in France, in Italy, in Germany, in Helsinki, in Mexico City, and now in Japan. But that replication was focused on the aspect of participation, but not in the aspect of experimentation. I think this is this is quite relevant because this is part of creating knowledge that not only the experience can be transferred, but also the knowledge of how that experience was done and how these features might affect, or even not technological interventions like the ones that are posting these uh, norms uh, might be very, very relevant and also connect with some discussion yesterday with our colleagues from the JITSI community and the Foundation for Public Code. I was also 
measuring the relevance of the code of, con uh, condo, uh, code of conduct for uh, be uh, behavior of the community that was creating the project.